and so on. Okay, tonight we are in Mark chapter 6, uh, finishing the chapter 6 of Mark. Uh, we're gonna be, it's going to be verses 30 through 56. Uh, now, two weeks ago we talked about Jesus sending out the disciples. He sent them out. And uh, they went throughout the land of Galilee, up north, and they're going to the villages. And they're talking about uh, Jesus. They're, they're talking about the kingdom. Uh, they're going out in Jesus' name. They're performing miracles. So they're stirring up some. Jesus had his own ministry and had crowds following him. Now he sent out the disciples two by two. Uh, and they didn't take anything with them. It's going to be a quick trip. They're going to different villages. And they're proclaiming. They're not, they're not necessarily... Uh, sharing, you know, we would say uh, the gospel, you know, accept Jesus Christ as your Savior because that, in a sense, doesn't make exact sense because there's no death on the cross, no resurrection. But they are proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, which is, includes Jesus. The gospel of the kingdom is, is Jesus, is the king, he is uh, the one, and in Jesus' name they're doing miracles, they're casting out demons. And so this is building up even more momentum. Now, in between them being sent out and their return, and they're going to return, and we're going to talk about those first night, uh, there's that parenthesis story about John the Baptist uh, being beheaded. And again, there, there's several things going on in these verses. Uh, we've got a general story that's flowing, but there's several little inserts that can kind of be drawn out. This is talking about the cost of discipleship. You know, John the Baptist is going to be executed. But it also is foreshadowing Jesus' execution. It's going to be a, 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 a betrayal in a sense. It's going to be something uh, political. It's going to, the ramifications are, are not going to be worth uh, what he, he's dying for. In a sense, John the Baptist is dying for a dance. Jesus is dying because the Jews are jealous. Uh, Pilate's going to try to set him free. John the Baptist... Even Herod himself, Antipas, didn't want him executed. He was actually the word was he was protecting him. He he didn't want him ruining his political career, but he didn't want to execute him. But he got trapped. Pilate got trapped, and so this is kind of foreshadowing where Jesus is heading. Now that that's again that story. The ideal of them returning now. There's great momentum. This there's great momentum, and Jesus uh, with this information here. Uh, with his disciples being out, you know, exposed as they were, he's going to want to retreat. Uh, not retreat like, you know, give up, but retreat like take a break. He's going to want to regroup. And this again, I think, again, as I have said quite a bit lately, uh, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm sometimes reading into the story, kind of looking at what's going on, and you got to, sometimes you look at the story from a different angle, that's not what's taking place. Like tonight we're going to talk about the 5,000, feeding of the 5,000 uh, during the 1800s, during the, uh, the philosophical development there of, you know, realizing and everything's rational. Uh, they realized or thought, and it was taught, I've heard pastors say it, I've heard pastors say it, that the feeding of the 5,000, what really happened was the people realize they're all kind of hoarding their food together in this massive group but when a little bit of food came out they all started well I've got some too and they all started sharing and the moral to the story is you need to share and if you all just share what you got everything's going to be fine that's not the moral to the story the moral to the story is Jesus is the Messiah he is the Son of God he took a little and fed the whole crowd it was a sign of who Jesus was now so, as that's just an example, of, I, I think the story's heading this way, but some, I've seen pastors branch off over here, and then they start talking about how we got to be a community, and it's like, well, well, there's a message for that too, but that is not the message of feeding the 5,000. And so, uh, Jesus, when these guys all come back, I'm going to think, and I think the Bible's re referring to this, they're going to go to a distant place, or a wilderness, they're going to go somewhere alone, where they can talk about some things, Jesus can, and again, don't forget... Jesus is, he's doing miracles, he's drawing a crowd, but when the crowd comes, he teaches. He's trying to explain, he's trying even there, the word of God. Jesus said it, you know, a man does not live on bread alone, but by the word of God. The word of God is what transforms you, it's what saves you, it's what separates you from the cosmos. 
the truth, the word, the word of God that created the universe. So Jesus, who is the Word in flesh, is going to speak words to the people to help them renew their soul and find the truth. Because the truth will set you free. So Jesus is going to be teaching. Now this time he's going to take his disciples away and teach or review with them, regroup, because they've been under stress, he's been under stress, there's crowds everywhere. Now, the Sea of Galilee, here we go, and there's some maps on the back here. Uh, if you go to, before we begin the story, uh, go to page 4, and there's going to be, here's the Jordan River feeding in, the Jordan River feeding in right here. Uh, we're going to have Capernaum, which is not in our story tonight. Uh, there's going to be Beth Bethesda, which is over here. Bethesda. This is where Peter and Andrew are from, and uh, Philip. Capernaum, Peter lives in Capernaum now, along where John and James are from. Jesus' ministry is there. Uh, there's a, a place right here, which we're going to call it Tabga. Is, uh, it's, it's a grassy area. There's a location there where Jesus is going to feed the 5,000, or the 1,000 are going to uh, be fed. And then there's this area right in here. It's like three and a half miles long, one mile wide. That's where our story ends. Gennesaret, I've got it as a dot right there, but it's about three miles by one mile. That's the area here. Now what Jesus is going to do, he's going to get in a boat with his disciples, and he's going to go somewhere, somewhere he's heading with his disciples to be alone with them to, in a deserted place. And so they're not got the crowds. The crowd is going to anticipate. Everybody's wanting to be with Jesus. But they think something big is happening. I mean, it is. Jesus is demonstrating now his disciples have just covered this area, and there's, there's even more excitement. So when he leaves, they're going to anticipate where he's going to go, and they're going to run ahead of him. Now, if Jesus is going somewhere else over here, he's going to end up docking right here. And this is where the people are. They're going to run ahead. Now, if they're going to run around the lake, it's going to be a 15 to 20 mile run, and they're going to have to cross this Jordan River right here, the crowd. Now, a couple people could make it, but 5,000 men and then women and children, uh, they're not going to cross this. I got a couple pictures of that. So, if Jesus is heading here, or if he's heading here and sees the crowd and branches off and stops there because he sees them as, as sheep without a shepherd, he's going to stop and he's going to teach them. Uh, and that's going to take place. It's assumed that is the place right there where that's going to take place. Uh, it's like two miles from Capernaum. Uh, in between here and Capernaum is where the Sermon on the Mount took place. There's a fertile area here. It's got a lot of grass. Uh, this was where a pilgrim identified this as the place because of traditions written down uh, in the like 380, 390. Uh, they, he, he says this is the place. That's kind of been accepted as the location. It matches all the maps. Uh, so it's not clearly identified. But that's where we're going to talk about what's going to happen tonight. He's going to end up coming here. He's going to talk to the people. It's going to get late. And there's a lot of excitement. And then he's going to for some reason, and I'll show you, he's going to send the disciples to Bethesda. He's going to dismiss the crowd alone. He's going to go up into the hills, the mountain, the ridge. There's a ridge right there to pray. One of three times Jesus goes away in the book of Mark and prays alone at night. And whenever he goes alone in, in Mark, there's always been a misunderstanding. His disciples don't understand exactly. They're going this way. He's going, guys, we're going this way this time. And there, there's a, a tendency to go a different direction. He goes alone to pray. Uh, again, here's I'm going to insert here. It appears he's not just praying his daily prayer, but he's, in a sense, focusing on his mission because there's the, the tendency, the disciples want to go this way, the crowds want to go this way. Jesus, who is man, wants to go that way, especially after John the Baptist got his head cut off. It's like, I can maybe take care of this right now. It's like, no, it's not time. He's got to stay focused. 
So he's going to go up and pray, and from there he's going to see his disciples struggling, getting over to, he sends them to Bethesda, over here. Uh, uh, Bethsaida. I'm sorry, Bethesda is the pool. I said Bethesda. Did you guys catch that? I, I saw you looking up easy. I thought, I thought did, what did I do? I want to do. Thank you. Bethsaida. Bethsaida. Uh, and I almost grabbed some pictures of that. Because it's an Old Testament city. It's, a, it's a, a little ways off the coast of the Sea of Galilee today. But the coast has moved. Bethesda is the pool of Bethesda in Jerusalem. Uh, but, but, and I always get those two mixed up, just like I do James and Paul and stuff. Okay, uh, they're struggling here to get over to Bethsaida. <clears throat> Jesus is going to watch them, then he's going to walk on the water and go past them, and they see him and they get frightened. He gets in the boat, and they end up docking at Gennesaret. So they never apparently make it here. They, they head this way, and when they get, he gets in the boat, they land here. And so some things are taking place right there. And I think what we're going to em emphasize here is the crowd is wanting a Messiah. They're wanting, Jesus sees them as a sheep without a shepherd. And now in the, in the church idea, the pastor's the shepherd. A sheep without a shepherd, uh, they're looking for a pastoral. Type. It's like the image there, the Old Testament image of a shepherd is, is a king. When, it, when the king is defeated, they don't have a shepherd. Or they find the king, and the king shepherds the people. I, I think it's pretty clear. There are sheep without a shepherd. They're looking for their king. Jesus is their king, but he can't be the king they want now. In fact, if we go over to the book of John, and I hope to get there tonight, just we don't want to spend a lot of time comparing all the Gospels, because now we're not teaching the book of Mark. We're teaching a, you know, a chronology or a, a correlation of the uh, Gospels. But in this very same story, the feeding of the 5,000, they, the people want to make Jesus king. And he puts a stop to it. So I think right up here is taking place. There's a tendency right here, the disciples, the crowd, they know this is the man. And this wilderness area here up in Galilee, outside of Jerusalem, I mean it's a ways from Jerusalem. Well, Josephus, this is Josephus organizes his, his group of 5,000 uh, his legion to fight the Romans in 67 A.D. in Galilee. It was common right here of rebel. Uh, even in uh, uh, Acts, uh, when Nicodemus is talking, they mention uh, the, the rebel leader from Galilee, that when he was killed, uh, his, his followers dispersed. And so this is a land that's known for rebels getting their forces together and going to war. Uh, the, a rebel did that in the book of Acts, it was referred to, and he was defeated. Josephus went there too, got his troops ready, went to war against Rome, and then was defeated and surrendered and joined with them. Well, Jesus is in that exact same position. It's not, it's not out of line to think, because it doesn't say, it's going to say, it doesn't say 5,000 people, it says 5,000 men. Now you say, well, that's because they only counted the men. The men were the most important. You can say it was a, a culture that, you know, if a man was there, then of course the family was there. But 5,000 men, that's the size of a Roman legion. And so, yes, there's women and children there, but the key is there were men. We have the military, the military is ready to join you. And the disciples, when they see this, you know, when the disciples, they've been talking about this, and they see the 5,000 men gathered here, uh, they're, they're ready. They're ready to push some buttons. I mean, they're probably urging this thing on and misunderstanding everything Jesus is teaching, as everybody is, and that's why you're going to see them probably be sent away to just row against the wind, go nowhere, and the crowd's dismissed, and Jesus goes and prays because this is one of those moments where it could have got out of control. This is one of those moments where the Jewish leaders would say, the whole nation is following him. If we don't get put a stop to it, he's going to start a revolt and we're going to lose our nation. And this is, this is not, again, this is not your, your Sunday school picnic and the families are running around and the kids are there flying kites and Jesus is making bread and he's telling parables about a butterfly and a flower and, and it's like it's a sunshiny day. Uh, and, and everybody got food and everybody was happy. 
this is a group of people that have come together and they are ready to they're ready to march. They're ready for war. And the king is there. And John says it very clearly. They wanted to take Jesus away and make him the king, or that would mean the shepherd, that he realizes they're like sheep without a shepherd. He can fill that gap. There's a void that Jesus could fill right here, right now, but it's the wrong time. Which means, as we go through this, you could, as we get all done with it, you could step back and look at this eschatologically. Is this going to be what it's going to be like when Jesus returns, meets the 144,000, gathers them, and marches on Jerusalem? Because Jesus is the king. He is the good shepherd. He will march as a militant leader, uh, first by himself, and then with the Israelites in eschatology. So is this similar to what will be taking place uh, eschatologically? Now, that's not, that's not the point of the story, but... If Jesus was being pushed into this right here, and it, because it all matched Scripture, he walked away from it the first time, because it's going to be something he'll do the second time. So with that information, uh, well, there's the map. Uh, I'm standing here on page five. I'm standing right here on right here on the coast, right here where this where the boat would have landed. Right, that's where I'm at, right there. And you can see now the second picture is. Uh, I've kind of gone up shore a little bit. You can see the grassy area. And now we're up into the hills, up here where the, the grassy place would be, where the people would have been organized. That's up in this area. And just to see the river, when they talk about the people not running all the way over here, they, again, they could have. When they said they ran to the other side to meet him, uh, I mean, they were going to have to go across this Jordan River. There's a picture of the Jordan River right there. That's coming in from the north. From uh, Mount Hermon, the foothills are in the... In the yeah, the foothills of Mount Hermon, water is running down from the melting snow. There's all kinds of springs, and it's filling up. And you can see water pouring in to the uh, Sea of Galilee right here. Uh, there's springs, and there, there's, there's a water source of the river. And then you see the map. There's the Jordan River right there. And uh, uh, see that little, there's a cross right there. It says... Uh, Tab Tabga Church, that little cross right there, that's this location right there. There's a church right there. Because that apparently is also the place that Jesus uh, saw his disciples out fishing after his resurrection. And they came and he had already had fish cooking for them. And that's where he talks to Peter in, in the end of John and says, Do you love me? Uh, feed my sheep. And that, that's where this took place right there. And that's, that's what that church is there kind of marking that location. But anyway, that's kind of some images that you've got right there. So, with that being said, I'm going to start in Mark chapter 6 and read through just the NIV. Uh, and then we're going to look at the notes and uh, build on it a little bit and, and uh, hear it in the English Standard Version, look at a few details. So here we go, chapter 6, um, verse uh, Verse 6 and 7, uh, look ahead. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. In this area, Jesus teaching village to village. Verse 7, calling the twelve to him, he sent them out two by two and gave them authority over evil spirits. So now they're going out two by two, going through the villages also. So he's teaching, they're teaching, momentum's building. It's like, if you want to say an advertising campaign, they're, they're hitting the market. Uh, and he said, if they don't receive you, move on. Uh, verse 11, they drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. So they've got the, the authority. Uh, then chapter 6, verse 14, that's the story of John the Baptist being beheaded. And that kind of fits right there. Uh, I should say this, this is the feeding of the 5,000. And this is going to be 5,000 Jews. There's going to be another story coming where he's going to feed 4,000. And that 4,000 is going to be Gentiles that follow him back into the land of Israel from uh, Phoenicia. He's going to go up into there and have a little ministry, a little tour in Gentile territory. When he comes back, they're going to follow him, and now they're going to multiply the bread here again. So that's a different, a different story. Um, all the Gospels, all four of the Gospels have this story. This is one of the stories that all four Gospels have, the story and the miracle in it. Okay, verse 30. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and talked. They've returned now. Then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, 
he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they, they've been working. It's like, notice Jesus calling for rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. So wherever they were going to go, the hotel reservations they'd made, someone got a hold of the, you know, paid some money, found out what rooms they were staying in. By the time we got to the lobby, the place was full of paparazzi, and they didn't get that. That's not exactly what happened, obviously. Uh, but either they're going to go, like I said, they're going to go ahead and meet them where the disciples are heading, or the disciples are heading somewhere and the people are following on the shore, and she's going to just veer off and land where the crowd is. Um, but many who were saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. I, that, that, you can't get away with that. He has compassion. They need some kind of leadership. I'll teach. I mean, he's going to empower them with truth because they need a leader. By this time, it was late in the day. So his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he's answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take eight months of a man's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? Now, again, we're going to read that in the English Standard Version. How many loaves do you have? He said, go and see. When they found out, they, they said, five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of 150. Then this is, I mean, that just sounds normal like a Bible story, except that is how you would divide a Roman legion up. You'd put them in orderly, fa you don't just have this big mass of 5,000 troops, you'd put those them in groups of 100 or 50, and they'd be in an organized fashion, each with their own leadership within that group. So he's even organizing them as in, in, in a military sense, uh, at least that's, that's a possible way of looking at it. Um, sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven. He gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to set before the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the men who had eaten was five thousand. Now, this is similar to Moses providing manna for the people and the quail. The difference is here is they gathered the broken piece. They gathered the, in Moses' case, the bread couldn't be kept. You had to wait until the next day to get If you kept it, it just molded. It, it wasn't any good the next day. So you had to eat it, and what you didn't eat, just trust God. There'll be something for you tomorrow. In this case, different than Moses, they gathered it. They were told to gather it and keep it. Uh, you know, so it would be good for later on. Uh, number of minutes, 5,000. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat. And that's an important phrase, the word immediately and made. We'll look at those words when we get here. Made his disciples get into the boat. That means they didn't want to get in the boats, and he made them get. It's like making your kid get in the car. He made the kid get in the car seat. doesn't want to get in the car seat. You get in the car seat. So there's a little bit, possibly a little bit of a debate there. Not saying they're anything disrespectful, but they don't want to leave. This is what we've been, we just got done talking, that's why all these people are here. You guys get in a boat and start rowing over to Bethesda. Bethsaida. Start rowing over to Bethsaida. But we want to get, go, go. I mean, it's, they're going. While he dis, okay, and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida. While he dismissed the crowd, after leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. And there's a, like I said, there's a ridge right there by Tegma that they could go to, that he could go to. When evening came, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land. And the idea there too is he's alone, but from that ridge he can see. You can stand there and you can see them rowing, going nowhere. 
he saw disciples straining at the oars, because the wind was against them. About the fourth watch, that's between 3 and 6 a.m. in the morning of the night, he went out to them, walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out, because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and says, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. I've got the Greek in the notes there. He says, I am, which is the Old Testament name for God. Don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. They did not understand about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. So they're going this way, and when they landed, they were here. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. They ran throughout the whole region and carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was, and wherever he went, into the villages, towns, or countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak or the tassels on the edge of his garment, and all who touched him were healed. And so that's the story we're looking at right here. And here is we got the English Standard Version and, and a few notes as we look at it. So you can see there's a lot of things taking place in that story. Uh, a lot of little tributaries of information that you could that, that are proving a point or demonstrating something, including Jesus walking on the water past them, uh, demonstrating his deity as God walks on the waters or treads on the waves. Uh, and he's, he's just demonstrating his deity walking past them. They see him, they misunderstand him walking on, on the water. They think he's a ghost. They don't think, oh look, there goes Jesus. They think it's a ghost. They think they're being haunted there in the Sea of Galilee. And the wind's blowing, it's nighttime. Of course, the fishermen, uh, they're used to being out there at night. Uh, the, the multiplying of the bread. They, they, Jesus didn't magically make bread. He miraculously multiplied the bread that they had. So once again, Moses had a staff. Use the staff, that's good enough. Go find out what you got. All we've got is these, these few loaves and a, few, a couple of fish. Good enough, I'll work with it. So there's another lesson there. There's many little lessons in here. So here we go. Chapter 6, verse 30, again, page 1 in the English Standard. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. That's what they would they, they explain their teaching, explain the deeds. Jesus is listening. And he said to them after they had shared what had been going on, and they'd been working hard, going house to house, or not house to house, but village to village. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves, no one's going to be with me, with us, to a desolate place and rest a while. They're going to go somewhere alone. Again, they're not going to go to a hotel. They're going to go to a desolate place. Again, where that place is at, are they going to go over here to Beth Bethsaida area in the, up here in the wilderness? Are they going to go further up here? Or are they planning on going to this grassy area up here where everybody's going to follow and anticipate him going? That's not clear in this. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. They're just busy all the time. And they went, went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them. So, I mean, these guys are, are famous. I mean, they're, I mean, they're people recognize their pictures aren't in the newspapers, because there's no newspapers with photographs. But people have seen them enough that they recognize the disciples, they recognize this group. So wherever they go, crowds are following. Uh, when, uh, they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. That would indicate that they're going somewhere, maybe this Tegma, uh, and that's why right, right here, this pilgrim between 18, 383 A.D., uh, it was a place of seven springs, and then it became it, it grew into an area there. Uh, it would be 15, 20 miles to go way over here. So it seems like they ran from, you know, where did Jesus start from in this story? I'm not sure in this account. Um, uh, it says in chapter 6, verse 34, When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them. So Jesus sees these people, they're, they're frantic about him. They're, they want to be with him. And he doesn't, isn't, he's not going away because he's irritated. He's going away because him and his disciples are human. They need to rest. They need to get a, have a break. But his desire for a break and his, his need for his disciples to have a break is overcome, once again, by his compassion. See, there's, 
there's that tension of him. They, they need a break. They need a rest. They need to eat. But they also realize these people have needs. And his compassion overrides. And he stops and goes up there. And it says, uh, and he uh, had compassion on them. Because they were like a sheep without a shepherd. And I think that begins to build on the idea that they are looking for a king. They're, they're, they, they are looking for one and they need one. They need a good leader. And he began to teach them many things. Uh, again, this will be similar to when Jesus does return to Jerusalem. He'll begin to teach, share the knowledge of God like Solomon shared the knowledge of God. And all the nations will stream to Jerusalem to hear his teaching. Uh, he's going to be teaching not just theology. He'll be teaching all aspects of reality uh, and, and how the world works. I mean, we talk about, you know, green energy. I, I, Jesus is going to be able to solve all kinds of financial, energy, agricultural, vaccinations. I mean, it's like Jesus is going to be, I want to say like Solomon, but actually Solomon was like a foretype of Jesus. Just imagine the knowledge he's going to have. Now, he's not up here, you know, I don't think he's up here, you know, waxing elegant about science and politics. He's He's sharing the word of what's going to set them free as far as the kingdom. But eventually when he comes back and rules on this earth, he's going to have to address the issues of the earth. And it's not just going to be magic. He's not just going to have a magic wand and start doing miracles. He's going to, he created reality. He's going to embrace this reality and show you how reality functions. So the king shows up to the people because he's got compassion. And what's he do? He begins to teach them, explain to them what, what is taking place. Um, and when it, it grew late, so again, this goes on and on. The crowd's not leaving. The crowd is there. Now, how long he talked, it doesn't say, but it, it wouldn't be unusual for it to be several hours. Here it would have to be sunlight, and now it's nighttime. The, the sun is going down. And his disciples came to him and says, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Now, as I read this, tr tr just see if you can feel, does this make sense? that everybody's hiding their food, and everybody's got a little bit of food, but they're afraid to break it out because they're afraid everyone's going to take their food from them. Uh, or it appears that they were rushing to find Jesus. They found him, and they didn't realize they were going to be staying for hours and hours. And now, we weren't planning on staying this long. Well, then leave. Uh, no. I mean, we're going to stay and listen to Jesus talk, which is, again, they're they're forfeiting the, their opportunity to go get food to a place that they're... They're, the disciples are concerned about their health and well-being. It's like, Jesus, it's getting late. These people just sit here and keep listening to you talk. Stop. Send them away so they can go get some food. Uh, they said, this is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away. The, now, it's interesting. Send them away. Now, here's the disciples wanting to send the people away. So what's taking place? They're wanting to send them away, but in a moment... Not a moment, but an hour or so later, a couple hours later, Jesus is sending the disciples away. So it's almost like the disciples are ready to break camp and send them back. But then a little bit later, it's like no one's wanting to leave, and Jesus has to make the disciples go away. So keep that in mind. When it was grew late, his disciples came uh, and said, This is a desolate place. The hour is late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages to buy themselves something to eat. So they all could have dispersed and at least went to the quick trips and the Casey's and, and you know, got themselves a slice of pizza and a pop or something. Uh, again, not that pop's the healthy food that you want to eat, but they would be getting, you know, their supplies that they would need. Now, this is where Jesus doesn't send them away. He, Jesus wants the people to stay. So we're going to have to supply. We're going to do something. So he says to the disciples, he says, uh, but he answered, you give them something to eat. Again, that, that, again, that's a strange answer. They're saying, okay, we, we care about these people. Uh, send them away so they can go take care of themselves. And Jesus said, well, let's keep the people, and why don't you take care of the people? You give them something to eat. And they're like, okay, they're right away, well, we're gonna, who, one of us is going to run to town and buy some bread. And that's what they say right here. Uh, but uh, send them away and get some of the uh, okay, we show, okay. But he asked them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to him? Now, 200 denarii is a day, uh, or one denarii is a day's wage. One day's wage. And 200 
Uh, again, the NIV translates that into what? Is it, let's say, three quarters of a year or something like that? What was the NIV translation? Um, an annual salary. An annual salary. Uh, 200 denarii, and that's, that's about what, if you figure you work, you know, 200 out of 365 days, uh, that's about a, a, a wages, a salary of a year uh, for all the bread. And what that would buy, that would buy 2,400 loaves of bread that are about the size of a small pizza, one inch thick and about seven to eight inches wide. So they could go and buy 2,400 of those, if you could find them, a bakery with 2,400 loaves of bread, uh, and the disciples going to, do they have that kind of cash? I mean, there's a possibility they've got that kind of cash in a bank somewhere because Judas has money, he, or he's going to become the, is the treasurer. So they maybe have that kind of money. But that's what they're thinking. But Jesus says, you go get, get it or give them. They says, shall, said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? Now that may have been a legitimate, they're not necessarily, money. you want us to go buy, you know, a year's worth of food? It, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna sign the the requisition. It's like we'll go get it. And he said to them, "How many loaves do you have? Go and see." Now, are they gonna go check their own supply of food? They got, they gonna go check their. How much did we bring along? Or what do you guys have? What have you brought? Uh, go and see. And when they had found out, they says, "We've got five loaves and two fish with us." And then he commanded them to all sit down in groups on the green grass. Now, if the people were sitting there and they're just hoarding their food, not going to open it up, um, that would mean they were sitting there getting hungry and hungry and hungry, uh, but not willing to eat anything. It's, it, that would not make sense uh, that, that there, all this food is hidden in the camp. Otherwise, it's not a problem. The people are just going to be, when they get hungry, they're going to reach in, grab a you know, slice of bread and munch on it or whatever. Uh, while Jesus is talking. They're in this area, desolate area, with no food. So they take a little bit of food. So that, that doesn't really make sense, nor is it even the point of the story that Jesus is trying to teach the people to share. Then he commanded them to sit down in groups on the green grass. And so this is where they sit down in, again, those groups of 50 or 100. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by 50s. And again, I point this out. Number one, orderly arrangement similar to a Roman legion of 5,000. The number of Galilean troops Josephus assembled for the 67 attack on Rome from Galilee. And rebel leaders often met here in the wilderness. And this was an area of rebellion. It was, you know, uh, a land that was willing to rise up. Herod had to come when he originally was given uh, uh, this area by under his father's jurisdiction. He had to put down all kinds of revolts, and, and there, was, there was criminals and bandits in this whole area. So this is a, kind of a wild west area already. Uh, Rome had brought up some control of it. Herod had organized it. But they were used to that, so having these 5,000 men up here uh, sitting in these groups organized, uh, it does begin to look like a military formation. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples the set before the people. So now again, the disciples are taking and giving to the people. They brought, says, go find out what you got. They brought it to Jesus. Jesus gave it back to them, and it began to just, they just, they didn't run out. In fact, uh, set before the people, and he divided the two fish among them all. And here's the, chapter 6, verse 42, and they all ate and were satisfied. It wasn't like they all got a snack to make it back to town. They ate as much as they wanted. They, they ate, they were completely satisfied. They couldn't eat anymore. They're all satisfied. It was like no more. And there's still food left over. Again, this is different than uh, some of the other examples. And they took up the 12, they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. So that's there's 12 baskets left. Some people want to make a connection. It's one for each of the disciples. You know, they've got 12 disciples, they each got a basket, or the 12 tribes. The point being. There was plenty there and plenty left. What did they do with it? Did they send it home with the people? Did they take it with themselves? And they took the 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. Again, that is a clear reference to a military number. Immediately, now, it, it seems like during this time, something began to take place. Um, remember the disciples were going to send them away. Now Jesus is going to make his disciples go. 
And then he's going to say to them in the boat that they misunderstood the loaves and the fishes. Meaning, did they see this as a preparation for war? What did they see this as? Let, let's go to uh, John 6. Just, I just want to see this in John 6. And, and then we'll come back. And I guess okay, we, we could go through, read this in each account of the Gospels. John 6. Verse, verse 1. Now notice right here. Um, let's just read this. John, John 6, verse 1. And this is the same, this is the same story. Uh, what, you, what we're reading is Mark's account, which is most likely Peter's story that Mark is recording. Now you've got John's account written around 85, 90 A.D. This account that we're just reading was written in 64 A.D., roughly. This account of John is probably 85, 90 A.D., but it's the same story. Chapter 6 of John, verse 1. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs he had performed on the sick. And that also included the disciples having just done some things. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples the Jewish Passover feast was near. This would be the third Passover feast that Jesus is going to go to. And when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Eight months' wages, or about $15,000, I wrote down in here at some point, uh, I got I got all kinds of notes here. Thirty thousand hamburgers at fifty cents each. Figures <laughs> five bites per burger. Okay, I got I had some of them. Some of the guys are getting my own figuring. Nonetheless, he asked. Uh, There's only to test him. Philip answered him. Eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. Now we find out some boy had this, but how far will they go among so many? So they went out and found out their resources. Jesus says, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, which is, right, this is exactly would fit. And the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. Jesus then took the loaves and gave thanks and distributed to those who, who were seated as much as they wanted, he did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to the disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, now here, right here, after the people saw the miraculous sign, which would include the disciples seeing this miraculous sign, they've seen Jesus cast out demons, they've seen Jesus heal people, they've seen Jesus do a wide variety of things, including calming the storm, uh, but they never. this is amazing. He's got them in military formation, 5,000 men seated in groups, he's just provided food for them, the, that, that, that Jesus did, with the sign that Jesus did, they began to say, the people saw this sign, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Moses said the prophet was going to come. That would be like Moses that they had to listen to. And that's what they asked John the Baptist, are you the prophet that is to come? Not just another prophet, but the prophet. There was prophets, but then there was going to be the prophet. The prophet was going to take what Moses did and expand on it. And they, Moses, you've got to follow him. If you did, if you miss him, you'll miss everything. So they say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. So now when you feed that in right there into the story that Mark's giving us, uh, they intend to come make Jesus king by force. So Jesus takes his disciples sends them away, because now that, that the leadership is gone, he's alone with the crowd, he's going to break this apart, dismiss them, and he's going to disappear into the, into the hills, and they're not going to know where he's at. 
Now this, this goes on interestingly here too because Jesus walks on water. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake where they got into a boat and set off across the lake. Uh, it talks about this. But then the next morning, this is a, a fun story here. We're not going to go to it. Uh, the crowd comes to Jesus again and they want more bread. And, and Jesus now realized that they missed both the crowd. And this is chapter 6. The rest of chapter 6 is a very harsh chapter because the people want bread. And they say, well, Moses gave us bread. And, and Jesus says, Moses gave you bread. I'm going to give you the bread of life. And they, they didn't understand it. They said, yes, yes, that's exactly what we want. And he's, he's trying to make a point, I am the bread of life. You need me, not bread. And they didn't understand it. Finally, he says, uh, well, I, I could read it here. You, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. I am the one. You need me. And, and they didn't understand it. And many people left. He turns to his disciples and he says to them, well, I should read it right here. Because that may be what it helps explain what's taking place on the boat. Um, uh, okay. <clears throat> Oh boy. Chapter chapter 6, verse 25. When they found him on the other side. This is the next day. See, they found him on the other side. And that's what Mark says too. They, they landed over here. When they found Jesus over here again, as what Mark is referring to. Uh, Rabbi, when did you get here? We saw you here, going here. And how did you get here? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. You are looking for me, not because you saw miraculous signs... Now, a miraculous sign is given, so you ask, what does this mean? A miraculous sign is sign. It's like, okay, this means, so God is trying to teach, reveal something here. What is the meaning? That's what they did right on the day of Pentecost. The, the disciples were speaking in tongues, and the Jew says, what does this mean? Peter raises his own voice and explained to them, this is what it means. He, it was a sign for you to say, we don't understand this. And Peter gave them an answer. Jesus multiplied the bread right here so they would say, what does this mean? And the disciples, what, what does, because the disciples are still learning and growing. What does this mean? Uh, he says, I tell you the truth, you are looking for me not because you saw a miraculous sign and are asking, what does that mean? What are you trying to tell us? But because you ate the loaves and had your fill. You're looking for me because you want more bread. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. I gave you bread yesterday, which was supposed to have you say, My gosh, what kind of man is this? Who is this? And he was going to say, I am the bread of life. I gave you bread for today, but I can give you bread, like the woman of the well. I can give you water that fills up to eternal life. I can give you bread. I am the bread of life. You want me, not my miracles, not my healings, not me casting out demons. You want me. My teaching is to bring you to me. That's what he's trying to explain. Uh, but food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Verse 28. Then they asked him, this is the day after this story, what must we do to do the works God requires? This is a huge line right here. What are the works God requires? Here it is. Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. What must we do to do the work that God wants us to do? This is it. It is one singular thing. Believe in the one he sent. In other words, Believe in me. Believe that I am the bread of life. That is the only work God wants you to do. I will take care of everything up to that point and everything after that. You have to believe in me or believe in the one God sent. So they asked him, okay, you want us to believe in the one God sent? He, they asked him, okay, sure, but what miraculous sign then will you give that we may see it and believe in you? So they understood, he says, believe in the one God sent. They understood that. Well, believe in me. Okay, well, we're going to have to have a miraculous sign. And it's like, well, I mean, you understand how ridiculous it is. we got crowds following him because of the signs. The disciples are doing signs. He just multiplied and fed 5,000 men with five loaves of, food, of, of bread. And now they say, okay, what will you do? 
Our forefathers ate manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them, now they're quoting scripture to Jesus. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. That's what Moses did. Can you do that? I mean, every day for 40 years? Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. It is not Moses who gave you that bread from heaven, but it was my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. It wasn't Moses who gave you the bread. That was something, well, Jesus would be saying, I was doing. He says, God the Father is going to give you the true bread from heaven, not just man and not just something you eat, but the true life. For the bread of God is He, watch, the bread of God, when it says, he will give you the true bread from heaven. What is the true bread from heaven? Well, here it is. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they says, from now on, give us this bread. Exactly similar to what the woman says. Well, sir, give me this water. Then Jesus declared, okay, I am the bread of life. And now listen, they're not making, they're not, they're not passing over that hurdle. They're thinking bread, munch, munch. Jesus talking about, I am life itself. If I give you myself, you have life. I'm like the bread of life. If you eat me, you now have life. You get it? Well, what will we have for supper? Okay, you don't get it. So, and now he's going to get, it's like you can just feel the tension or, or the dullness. If you've ever like taught like a, a child, you know, like you te I try to treat my grandchildren or my sons or something, you know, how to do like a math problem or how to, and it's like they just don't get it. And you just kind of have to wait until they're a little bit older, all of a sudden they get it. Well, they're at this point right here that, that these people are not understanding this. And, and, and the disciples are not either. The, that's why the disciples are going to get sent away the night before because they're not helping. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. See, when he says hungry, they think, oh, man, every day. It's like, no. And he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Oh, you've got water too? It's like, no. But as I told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. You, you, you do not believe in me. You only see the miracles. You only see me giving you food. You cannot see that I am God, I am the one who gives you eternal life. All that the Father gives me will come to me, which means you are probably not one the Father gave me because you cannot even see me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And that's probably what Jesus was praying the night before. When the, everybody's ready for him to become king, it's like, i got to pray. And he's going to go pray and do the will, not my will, not your will, but the will of the Father who sent me. And I think that is the key to that prayer the night before. The same thing took place in the Garden of Gethsemane. Take this cup from me, take this cup from me, but not my will, but yours. My will is that you find another way to get salvation for these people so I don't have to die. But not my will, but your will be done. I mean, that was, a, I mean, that was, the, that was Gethsemane. It wasn't Jesus just doing his daily devotions. It was Jesus saying, I want to do what I want to do. I want to save myself. I don't want to do this as a man. But I didn't come to do my will. Otherwise, he would have followed Satan. You know, the temptations. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of them that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is this, is, excuse me, is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. So if you've looked to the Son and you've believed in the Son, you have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. At this the, the Jews began to grumble about, about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Also now the Jews that were fine, it's like, now they're getting into the theological debate. They don't understand what's going on. So now they're begin, beginning to grumble about him. Like, he's not making any sense. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph? And again, see how close they look at Nazareth is right here. They're right here. Nazareth is right here. Wait, you didn't come down from heaven. You are anointed by God to do miracles. Now do some more stuff for us. Well, you got to believe in me. We do. Do some more miracles. No, I came down from heaven. You didn't come down from... 
he, isn't Joseph his father? Uh, uh, they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Then Jesus says, stop grumbling among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last time. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. And that explains, no one has seen God, the Father, we've only seen manifestations or theophanies of the second member of the Trinity, the Word of God, who became flesh. I tell you the truth, he who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate manna in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give to, for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply amongst themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last days. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks... Now again, he's not talking about cannibalism. He's talking about a metaphor of the life that he is, his physical presence and the life that he has. You have to believe in this. And the only way you can eat this is by faith. You've got to believe it. You've got to trust it. Just as the living, the living Father sent me, I, have, I live because of the Father who is the one who feeds on me. Okay, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your fathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. On hearing this, look at verse 60. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Now, if you're reading this and going, whoa, what is... His disciples say, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept this? Jesus, we need to tone this down. Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, just like he's going to say in the boat, that they didn't understand the loaves and the fishes, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? What if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. Yet some of yet there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe, and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. Verse 66. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. And then he turns to the twelve. You do not want to leave too, do you? Says, he says to Jesus, says to the twelve. So many of his disciples said, we're done. I mean, they began to get to that group that followed him. I mean, the, there's the twelve and there's a core that followed him around. At that time, many of them walked away. He turns to twelve and says, are you guys done too? And now watch Peter. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Then Jesus replied, have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. And he meant Judas of Iscariot. So notice right there, many leave. He turns to the disciples and says, Do you want to go too? But Peter says, You have the truth. You have the bread of life. I mean, where else are we going to go to get it? You are the one. So that's all the tension that's taking place right here. What time is it getting to be? Is it? Yeah, it is. 8 o'clock. Okay, well, let's clean this up next week. Because we're going to get to that point right here. And they all ate and were satisfied. I'm back on page 2 of the notes. Verse, verse Chapter 6, verse 45. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side towards Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. Uh, and so, that, I mean, that's he's making them leave. He's dismissing the crowd. He goes to pray. And then, where does it say there? Um, verse, chapter, page 3, chapter 6, verse 51. And he got in the boat. Now, he walks past them. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves. 
but their hearts were hardened. They did not understand. At that, that night, right here in this boat, they had no idea what just took place here. Jesus was giving them food, multiplying food, for a sign. It was a sign that the crowd and the disciples should have asked, well, what does this mean? He says, I have the bread of life, or I am the bread of life. But all, they couldn't get past All they wanted, they came back the next day, they wanted breakfast. And that was a sign to them to say, what, what does this mean? Moses gave them manna. And Moses, they just went out and picked it up. Moses didn't give them manna. God gave them manna. Moses just was the one who was you know, overseeing the activities. But Jesus now is actually giving them the food. It's not like he's not finding it growing you know, like dew in the morning. He's actually multiplying it. It's like, how is he doing it? And it's not a magic trick. It's like, they're supposed to ask why. How? And he's going to tell them, because I am the bread of life. And, the, and everybody ate and were satisfied, but no one asked the question. The disciples, they're ready for maybe to help mount up a military, because if he can provide food, we can march anywhere. And the disciples are sent across the sea, and we'll pick it up uh, next time. I got in that the box right above that, chapter 6, verse 51, where it says 650. For they all saw him and were terrified, but immediately he spoke to them and says, Take heart. It is I, do not be afraid. In the box below that you can see the Greek, ego me, which means I am. And then the, the English adds he, I am, I am he, I, I am Jesus. But he said, right there, he uses this right, very clear in the Greek, he says, I am. Uh, for they all saw him and were terrified, but immediately he spoke to them and says, take heart, I am, uh, fear not. And so he's he's part of that walking by is his demonstrating his his deity, again trying to help them make the connection. I am, and you just mult I just multiplied bread, and it's like and the, he got in it's like it says right here they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. They were thinking military. They were thinking food, and he separates them from the crowd and dismisses and says okay. A total, I mean, John chapter 6, possibly one of the low points. This right here is a great story. Combine this with John chapter 6. It's like one of the, it's where the ministry starts to split because it's like Jesus is driving this to the point of I'm not just going to keep doing miracles and doing a you know a tour, touring Jerusalem and Galilee and doing all these things. It's like, no, it's decision time. I am the bread of life. Do you know who I am? Well, yeah, you you were sent by God to give us food. Can we have breakfast? It's like no, we're going further than breakfast. We're going to eternal, and they, they couldn't make that because their hearts were hard. And these disciples were distracted possibly by military, possibly by the food. Uh, eventually, Simon's going to come around. Interesting, John gives Simon credit for saying the right thing in 90 AD in, in his gospel. I'll pray, and we'll pick this up. I kind of thought we'd get through this, but I should have known better. I'll pray, and, and we'll, we're free to go. Father, we thank you for the chance to look into these things. We thank you for your word. We do ask that we would honor Jesus that the Spirit would soften our hearts and enlighten us, that we may see the things that we do not understand, that we, the things that we, uh, our own sin nature, our own human nature, it prevents us from hearing and understanding, that we may truly embrace Jesus Christ and continue to grow in the strength that He.